Welcome to Gerard Alliance Church Online. I'm so glad that you decided to watch this video. Uh, the, the, the verse that I'm reminded about today is where it says in the Bible, Today is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Aren't you thankful that every day we can rejoice in what God has done, is doing, and is going to do in our lives? Would you take a moment and pray with me? Father God, we thank you and praise you for this day. Today is truly the day you have made. And I pray that we will rejoice and be glad in it. And although, Lord, we don't know what today holds or what the future holds, we know that you are a God who has ordained our days, who loves us and knows us. And so we trust you with our lives. Father, would you guide and direct us as we look into your word today? Uh, would you take all the distractions away um, from our heart and from our life? And uh, Lord, we just, we just surrender them to you now. Would you take them? We surrender them to you. They are yours. Uh, would you be glorified in and through all that we say, think, and do? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, amen and amen. Uh, this past Sunday night, it was a really exciting time for Gerard Alliance Church. Uh, we had a wonderful time celebrating Pastor Tyler's accomplishment of being licensed within the Christian and Missionary Alliance. There were a few people uh, who were a part of that installation service that have either known Tyler for quite a while or have just been getting to know him. And there was this one phrase in particular that I heard over and over again. Speaking of Tyler's calling on his life, they stated this, What I have seen, I know God has done. What I have seen, I know God has done this. They highlighted the importance of two things. One, what they've experienced, what they saw and heard. And two, that God was the one who made it possible. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 16, In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And when Jesus gives his new commandment, he says in John 13, 34, and 35, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, by this, when people see and hear it, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You know, these are two perfect examples of experience that turns into belief. Experience turning into belief. Most of the time, for someone to believe something to be true or real, they need proof. That's why uh, you'll hear time and time again someone say, I'll believe it when I see it when I see it. Is it wrong to take this approach? No, not necessarily. I mean, we've dubbed one of Jesus' disciples as Doubting Thomas, but in the end, he gives one of the most heartfelt and genuine confessions. He says to Jesus, my Lord and my God. But in the very next verse, we can't miss this, in the very next verse, Jesus says to Thomas, have you believed because you have seen? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Dallas Willard put it this way, now follow me here for a minute. He said, we don't believe something by merely saying, speaking it, that we believe it. Or even when we believe, we believe it. We believe something when we act as if it were true. Think about that. We believe something when we act, when we follow through with it, when our actions meet up with what we know and what we think and what we believe. That's what belief looks like. This goes along with what John 
wrote in 1 John 3.18, he says, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. You see, love in action is what gravitates people to God. Love in action is what gravitates people to God. What is heard and seen is a great way to influence belief. In John's gospel, he writes, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen, John says, his glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and in truth. So simply put, most of the time we hear and see and then believe. For the next two weeks, I want us to look into the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Colossians, and that's where we'll camp out this week and next. Now, I want to let, let you know about something, I want to key you in on something. When I preach sermons, there are two things. I do. First, and most importantly, I want to hear from God and be led by the Holy Spirit. Number one thing, for me, that is the utmost importance. I don't ever want to preach a sermon or a message that isn't led by God. I don't ever want to persuade you to live a life that is contradicting to the message of the gospel. Second, I do my best to give a variety of ways of approaching the scriptures. At times, I'll preach sermons that are encouraging and uplifting, that are used to build up and edify the body of Christ. Other times, there may be a need to to shed light on a conviction or a miscue or a rebuke or a discipline. And then there are other times where we need to be challenged. But here's the most important important and actually interesting part. Every sermon will resonate differently for every single person. Every sermon will resonate differently for each of us. It has a lot to do with the seasons of life we're in or the inner and and outer circumstances that we are dealing with, but one truth remains the same. My prayer and desire for each message is that it brings glory to God and draws each of us closer to Him. Every message, it brings glory to God and draws each of us closer closer to him. So with that being said, please turn with me into your Bibles to Colossians 1, 3 through 8. Colossians 1, 3 through 8. 1, we'll look at verses 3 and 4. The first point is reasons to praise, reasons to praise. Look at verses 3 and 4 with me says this, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. Have you ever thought about this truth before? There is always a reason to praise God. Hallelujah. There's always a reason to praise God. It's, it's everywhere in the Bible. Psalm 63, 4 says, I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Psalm 86, 12 says, I will praise you, O Lord my God, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forever. One of my favorites in Psalm, Psalm 150, verse 6 says, Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Amen. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. I love what the NIRV translation of Jude reads. It says this, Give praise, there it is again, Give praise to the only God our Savior, glory, majesty, honor, power, and authority belong to him. And then it says this, give praise to him through Jesus Christ our Lord. His praise was before all time, continues now, and will last forever. Amen. 
Revelation 4.11 says, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. There is always a reason to praise God. Always. You know, there's times where my family and I, before we go to bed, we, we pray together. And there's some times where we just say, hey, let's name some things that we're thankful for. What are you thankful for? Name one thing. <laughs> and we always say that you can't repeat, right? You have, to, you have to come up with something else because there's so many things to be thankful for and praise God for. But it's, it's reasons to praise God for who he is and what he's done. You know, think about that. What if each one of us, this week, the first thing we did when we woke up in the morning, before we check our phone or before we get out of the bed for that matter, what if we just out loud praised God for something? Not just in the morning, but, but what about in the evening, too, before our head hits the pillow? What if we just paused and gave God a moment of praise. I think I've said this before, but I remember uh, growing up, my grandpa Hammerly, uh, before every prayer, family prayer, whether it was at an event or, or it was at a family dinner or, or even just a holiday dinner, he would always begin his prayers by saying this, Lord, again, we just pause to thank you for. Lord, again, we just pause to thank you for. I mean, how awesome would it be if we paused to thank him a few times out of our day? Not just the obvious times, right? Not in the mornings, not just in the mornings and the evenings or, or you know, at every, at every meal time. But, but how about like when we're driving to work in the morning? Or right before our test that we have at school? Or, or when we're doing the dishes or, or mowing grass? Find moments to praise God. God. There's always reasons to praise God. We can clearly see this from Paul as he begins his letter. Other than the automatic introduction that we see, the very first phrase out of his mouth is this, we always thank God. <laughs> we always thank God. There's two other instances in Paul's letters that I find fascinating when it comes to this thought of always thanking God. The first is found in 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 10. It says this, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, per persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always, listen to this, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. I mean, talk about reasons to praise. Even through the difficulties, even through the suffering in those moments where you are bending to the point of feeling as if you're going to break, there's always a reason to praise God. Philippians 4, 8 says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, pure, lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and then he says this, if there is anything worthy of praise, anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Did you catch that? I love that part. If there's anything worthy of praise, what is it in your life today that gives you a reason to praise God? But notice what Paul and his companions are doing when it comes to praising God. He says, when we pray for you, <laughs> pray, when we pray for you. All right, time out. This is a very good moment for me to say thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, church. Thank you, people. I want to thank you for praying for me and my family. I, I know that there are people, uh, because they've told me, but there are people sitting here right now who are actively praying. 
I can't tell you how much it means. That means so much that you pray for me. Throughout my week, it's encouraging to hear, I'm praying for you, Pastor. I just actually talked this past week with somebody that said, Pastor, I try to pray for you every single day. Hallelujah, thank you so much. I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Prayer is powerful. Prayer is used to actively seek God and and desire His will above our own. Listen, if there is someone in your life that you know without a shadow of a doubt that's praying for you, take a moment to thank them. Take a moment to thank them. It's so easy for us to take prayer for granted, but without it, we'd be lost. We'd be hopeless. There are always reasons to praise God. So, Paul gives them reasons for his praise. He tells them first, we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. If you are here today, if you're you're watching this video and you're hearing me say that, and you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have a reason to praise. You have a reason to praise. You know, when when Anne-Marie... And, and Tyler stand up here on a Sunday morning and they proclaim that, that a child or a youth has given their heart and life to Jesus. That's a huge reason to praise. I mean, we, we clap our hands and we praise God for that. You know, Jesus says in, in Luke 15, 10, Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. One sinner who repents. His second reason to praise is the love that they have for all the saints. Now, what Paul means by this is is what he mentions in Philippians 2, 1 through 4. The action of placing others, right, ahead of yourself. To deny yourself, which is an action and a testimony of what Jesus Christ did for each one of us. The love that he showed us. Paul writes, so if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same Mine, there it is. Having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from rivalry or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. There are reasons to praise God. Second, look at verses 5 and 6. Heard and seen. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. You know, there's no doubt in my mind that when you hear and see something, it's a lot easier to believe it. I mean, if we took something as secondhand information, typically our, our gut reaction or our, our knee-jerk response is to say, nuh-uh. Or a lot of times I find myself saying, no way. No way. That, that's crazy, Right? Now, i got to be careful with who I say that to because some may feel as if I, I don't believe them or, or I think that they're lying. That's, that's very rarely ever the case. Usually my no way is more of a reaction of, of what I've just heard or seen rather than who's telling me something. But think about it. It's always more convincing if we are the ones to see or hear it. I wonder why we are the way we are when it comes to this idea. You know, as 
Jesus is giving the explanation of parables to his disciples. He closes out the conversation by telling him this. Listen to this. This is amazing. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. Truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. Think about it, could there be moments in our lives that we take for granted what we hear and what we see? Absolutely. Have you ever heard of that, that phrase, uh, it's right under my nose? It's a phrase that is used to express something that is right in front of you. It, it's so obvious, it's right there that, that somehow, though, we become oblivious to it. So there's this, this chain reaction that is occurring that Paul wants to not only bring to their attention, but commend them for. And, and, and he says this, you have heard, there it is, before in the word of truth, the gospel which has come to you. So here Paul emphasizes it's, it's what they've heard, the word of truth, or, or the gospel has been preached to them. They've heard it. They know it. But something seems to be left out for now. The question could be, do they understand it? Now, everybody knows, if you're a parent, um, that you've heard that from your kids before. You're trying to help them with something or explain something to them, and they just simply say, I know. <laughs> I know, Dad. I know. A lot of the times, I don't know about you, but I want to respond, yeah, you might know, but do you understand it? Right? I mean, there's a big difference between knowing something and understanding it. Second, Paul then says, as indeed the whole world, it is, uh, in the whole world, it's bearing fruit and growing as it also does among you. So, so the word of God right now, the gospel is not only being told, but it's creating a testimony. They are, are, they're, they are putting feet to the word of God, so much so that it's gaining attention in the whole world. Well, how do we know it's gaining attention? How do we know it's active and effective? Well, because Paul says it's bearing fruit and growing. Basically, he's saying, hey, we're not only hearing it, but we're seeing a difference. There's a change that's taking place. God is working and moving by the power of the Holy Spirit. People are coming to faith in Jesus Christ left and right. Souls are being saved. People are being transferred from death to life, from darkness to light. We hear it and we see it. And then finally, Paul says, since the day you heard it and understood it. Ah, there it is. Understood the grace of God in truth. Yeah, but Paul, could, could you be exagger exaggerating just a tad? Anyone can overemphasize something, right? I mean, especially if they're the main proponent of the mission or movement. Could we be getting a little overzealous here? No, Paul wants these believers to take into consideration their own witness and testimony of what they've heard and seen and what they've experienced and how they've believed because of what God has done. I mean, this is no joke. God is doing some amazing and incredible things right now. Think about, he's, he's trying to tell them, hey, listen, think about what you heard and how you understood God's grace in your life. Think about that moment when, when God invaded your heart and life and the impact he's had on you. From then up until even now. I mean, in a way, Paul seems to take this stance that, hey, listen, you can't deny what you yourself have seen and heard. Lastly, believed. Look at verses 7 and 8. Believed. He says, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. And has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So, so this is where belief comes in. If, if someone believes something, 
they usually don't just believe it for themselves, right? They don't just, just leave it there. They believe in it, but they don't really necessarily mention it to anyone else. No, if someone is truly convinced, they'll stop at nothing. They will find a moment in casual conversation to present it to someone else. I mean, think about it. Every interaction, think about this, this is incredible. Every interaction that we have with someone could be the precursor to someone else's belief in God. That's pretty cool. Every conversation that we have with someone could be the precursor to their belief in God. The moment that they believe. I'm not saying that you have to to force the conversation. Believe me, I've been there and done that and it has not ended well. But the Apostle Peter did tell us, he did instruct us in 1 Peter 3, 13 through 16. He said this, Now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them nor be troubled, but in your hearts, here it is, Regard Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that you have that is in you. Yet do it, he says, with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your name or your good behavior in Christ Jesus may be put to shame. So, to end here, Paul uses the example of Epaphras. Think about it. If you're trying to convince someone to believe something, wouldn't you want to name drop a little bit? Right? You would. I mean, wouldn't you want to let other people know who have already uh, bought into or been persuaded to believe in that? Paul says in Philippians 4, 9, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. So more than likely, Epaphras was the very person who introduced the church in Colossians to Paul. And not just Paul, but he introduced the church to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Epaphras was regarded by Paul as a fellow servant and a a faithful minister in Christ Jesus. But don't miss his phrase. He says, on your behalf. On your behalf. You see, Paul wants to make mention that Epaphras has come before Paul and God to vouch for their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Epaphras has heard and seen and now believes in the work that God has done in the church at Colossae. So much so that Paul adds this, he has made known to us your love in the Spirit. In other words, Epaphras has believed the work that God has done in your life so much so that he testifies about it. He created a testimony about it. Have you ever uh, made a recommendation before? I I look forward to those moments that I'm asked to write a recommendation letter for someone. According to Romans 12, uh, one of my spiritual gifts is, is encouragement or exhortation. So I've been blessed by by others in my life who've come alongside me and spoken a a word or been there for me when I needed it most. And Epaphras is being used as a blessing and an encouragement here. He wants Paul and the rest of them to know that the work that God is doing in and through the Colossians is a testimony to the greater work that's being done to advance the kingdom of God. Heard, seen, and believed. I love those moments where I exclaim, I can't believe it. (laughs) I can't believe it. You know, I usually follow it up with, God is good. God is good. My prayer and challenge for you this week is that you'll find those moments and reasons to praise God. May God use you to speak life 
into someone else so that they can be drawn closer to him. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you and praise you for this day, for this opportunity to look into your word. And God, I just pray that each of us will be encouraged today to know that there's always a reason to praise you. God, speak life into us today. And this week, may we go out. May you use us as your hands and feet to reach a lost and dying world in need of you. Father God, we love you and we thank you. We give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go in that grace.